well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? I don't have an Arizona raspberry flavored tea in front of me, so if the show goes really poorly, everyone knows why. Ka-ching! My name is... What does that sound? Is that the raspberry iced tea sound? Yeah, that's the uh, sponsorship ka-ching noise. Oh, right, yeah. That would be nice. Uh, Four Rooms and From Dust Till Dawn is happening mm-hmm. today. It is. My name is uh, Eric, and the guy whose job I'm already stealing is Michael Oh, Kester. it's okay. Totally fine with that? Yeah, well, today I am. I'm. I want to talk about drinking off of feet and hookers <laughs> yeah, not in the mattress. Drinking out of oversized tea cans, but rather off of feet. Uh, you know, we used to feel that the Tarantino Rodriguez shows were almost our our need to prove something. Yeah, I think uh, we're doing four rooms in from dusk till dawn. Yeah, we, that era has clearly we've killed the goat. The goat is dead. That is uh, not what's happening with this double feature at all. We have. Um, we're going to do them in that order too. Mm-hmm. It's kind of this. Uh, this. I'm going to call it a sandwich of questionability. Order, wow. right? That's so well, we'll talk about it with four rooms, but think about the order of four rooms. Sure. And think about the order from dusk till dawn. Uh-huh. I would definitely not say the meat of the sandwich is the questionable part of those two films. That's true. You could do them in the opposite order. Mm-hmm. You could fucking start strong and it could get weird and then you could come out of this strange area and then it could end strong. But that that just seems to make too much sense for our show. Yeah. Also, I think from dusk till dawn is great the entire time. No, I'm not going to argue with that at okay. all. Okay. But I like a, I like the bottom bread of this questionable if sandwich. A, if there's a questionable part of From Dust Till Dawn, I mean, you you wouldn't debate that, right? We're going to talk about I'm it. I'm just saying right now, if anybody says the questionable half of From Dust Till Dawn, I kind of think you know what they're talking about. Sure. We're getting into spoiler territory. We are. All right. So there's going to be chapters. And there's going to be spoilers. Great. Use the chapters to skip the spoilers. Problem fucking solved. And so we start with Four Rooms. Yes. Which uh, kind of has this obscure found film quality to it. Yeah. You know what? I, maybe it's because I actually found this as a found film. Right. I, um, uh, like 10 goddamn years ago, uh-huh. probably longer at this point, I worked at a place that sold videotapes. Let's uh-huh. go ahead and leave it at that. Sure. We did not rent videotapes. We merely sold videotapes. And so in the middle of using my talents to alphabetize videotapes uh-huh i discovered two important things one one is that there's only four types of movie covers uh-huh. and they just copy and paste there's four movie cover templates one has some big floating heads i'm not going to ruin it for you just go into a, a blockbuster no, never mind go to your friend's house a place where you can still rent videotapes and uh and look at that number two was that there was this thing called four rooms uh-huh. wedged in the back of a row of dvds that seemed to have some pretty popular names on it like and Madonna. so well, I was going to say uh, Allison Anders and uh, Alexander Rockwell. Or yeah. The, but you ruined the setup to my wonderful joke. I'm so sorry. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing those names right. You know, Allison Anders is, uh, she directed an episode of The L Word because she's a female director and all right. female directors direct an episode of The L Word apparently. That's right. And um, Alexander Rockwell did uh, 13 Moons, that movie with Steve Buscemi. Uh-huh. Those are not the, the big names on there, but they are the first two names, which yeah. is uh, kind of weird. Also, of course, Rodriguez and Tarantino. Yes, along with Madonna, Tim Roth, and Marissa Tomei. So Marissa Tomei, I, I, I have the DVD of this sure. one. Sure, okay. And Marissa Tomei actually exists not only in the the titles where they say the actors' names, but uh-huh. she's also on the cover sure. of the DVD. Great. Marissa Tomei's part in this film is maybe, what, four minutes? What does she do in this movie? She's the one that Ted calls that's... Supposed to be the manager. Kind of weird, right? Yeah. Kind of bizarre. The burnout chick that's having a party and... Not the actual manager, but the woman who answers the phone. Yes. Yeah, you know, and you look at the cover and you kind of go, wait, where was that girl in the... Because she doesn't look burned out on the cover. She's wearing an elegant dress... It, I mean, her hair's done up really nice. Yeah, everything about it. Yeah, I I almost question that that's really her. Mm -hmm. I'm going to assume you know what you're talking about, though. Marissa Tomei. Weird. The movie opens on... The old bellhop, right? Yeah. Kind of showing the pictures of his adventures, uh, the trinkets that he has kind of lying around. And you get uh, Tim Roth for the first time, mm-hmm. who we'll get to, who's uh, very strange in this movie. Yeah. But also you get the opening theme to- With the, with the cartoons and the- Yeah. 
kind of it's kind of a it's kind of a spark noted preface to what's about to happen. Sure. sure. Is the music weirder or the cartoon? Because I have trouble picking. I'm gonna go with the music no the cartoon is str- it's hard to say it was the, the 90s. cartoon doesn't get stuck in your head like the music does. that's true does this music follow you around and haunt you in your day-to-day life yeah pretty much this is one of those things that every three or four months it gets stuck in my head and i have <laughs> no idea because it's not like you hear it anywhere right? right it's uh i think it's called vertigogo it's by combustible edison it was in remember when we did secretary mm-hmm. i don't know if i even mentioned this on the show because i was a little uncertain of it and i thought i was just going crazy again as if the music was just appearing in my head while i was trying to record the show but when Lee's mom is waiting for her in the car, mm-hmm. the theme from Four Rooms is playing over the radio. Huh. Don't ask why. No idea. So Tim Roth is fucking weird. I, you yeah. know, Tim Roth, this was kind of back in the post um, Reservoir Dogs days mm-hmm. in uh, the era of uh, Pulp post, Fiction. Yeah, it was right after Pulp Fiction. Yeah, which is an interesting place for this to be because that's really when Tarantino's kind of blowing up. Sure. Tim Roth has found this uh, this pretty expansive career of his own since then. Yeah, but not the same kind of career. No, no, not at all. He's he he does this star. I mean, they they mention it when we get to the Penthouse mm-hmm. film. Uh, they talk about the Jerry Lewis film, The Bellhop, sure, the silent sure. role, and it's clear that Tim Roth is doing an homage to this, except for the fact that he can talk. Yeah, and his speaking personality sure. is coupled with this silent actor mime routine i was just gonna say it's that, as if he's silent acting but he can talk yeah and it makes him such a weird over the top his hand is always flighty and up to the left and right he's always kind of his head's cocked over Your his gestures right shoulder. are amazing right now i wish people could <laughs> see them and now he's or rather was the uh, lead on that show lie to me that you also to air a show on Fox. where he's known for a gesture where he yeah pl- come on you know what i'm talking the, uh, about the droopy finger yeah, with the, the kind one. of kind of lining yeah, his eye it. of sight up with it <laughs> yeah, i really it. liked him roth i'll watch anything he's in yeah he's really uh eccentric in this um but he's got these strange i don't even know that i'd call them feminine gestures they're really they're the gestures you see in silent movies yes yeah. it kind of shows how absurd <laughs> the acting and in uh, silent films is uh, if you look at that in a role where someone is behaving in real life. Right. Or at the very least can talk. So the the first in the, I guess you would call this an anthology. For some reason, I don't like the word anthology. Anthology seems too long. This movie's like, what, an hour and 20 minutes? I probably don't like anthology because I prefer to ramble on and try and explain. It's a thing. It's Should we call four, it a quadrilogy? There's four shorts and they're kind of, they're back to back. They're all, but they tie in or something. We already covered shorts anthology it is so the first one's the missing ingredient and i think the first one's easiest if you imagine it as a play right yeah well i i think the first one's easiest if you ignore the witch that has a southern accent (laughs) it's the one with the southern accent that bothers that's the one that drives me nuts also the other one that the other thing that really drives me nuts is when they're all around the cauldron doing their individual are you about to talk about three times three times three no Sorry, go ahead then. But what I am talk- going to talk about is um, when... I can't remember the actress's name. Doesn't matter. But when the one... I believe she has the tears or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. The girl who is on um, uh, other HBO show, Six Feet Under. Um, And she kind of... Her rhyme, she has a shortened line in it. Uh, it's dear whatever something something we live without sun but everybody else had these really long lines and her second line is really short that throws me off every time and i fucking cannot get my head around what you would make a terrible witch a terrible i'd be the worst witch but i i have plenty of the missing ingredient you know i know this is the first one but i've seen it so many times that i feel like i can no longer be objective about it Mm -hmm. not that that's what our show is about anyways sure I, I'm watching it as if it's it's something I made ten yeah. years ago. You know, I yeah. just don't. I'm aware of what it is. I kind of remember the beats of the story. I can't look at it and judge it, or even sit back and enjoy. It's just the beginning of Four Rooms. That's what it will yeah. always be. It's like trying to remember. Um, I it, this is weird because I don't have a very nostalgic period of my childhood. But I assume people, you know, like cartoons. Give me a yeah. cartoon from the '90s that was popular. 
shit, dude. I didn't have cable. So Okay, so this is a terrible. This is already serious double feature territory. We have yeah. no idea what's going on right Beast now. Beast Wars. I watched a lot of Beast Wars. Oh, that doesn't even sound familiar to me. What about Nick at Nick in the Morning? Didn't have Nickelodeon. 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 Rugrats was a show okay, on there. Nickelodeon. Okay, that sounds familiar. Rugrats. There's a theme. There's an intro theme yeah. from Rugrats. Ba, 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 ba. Copyright infringement. ka When you hear the theme from the Rugrats, you don't think about the quality of it. You don't think about um, what they're doing. What You just hear the fucking theme from the Rugrats. Mm-hmm. That's how Rugrats, the Rugrats? Rugrats, I believe. Oh, this is a disaster. I've never seen the show. Are you getting my point? Yeah, I get the point, but we are the worst people to discuss Rugrats. Anyways, this is a, a weird selection to be the first one because it's the most bizarre one. Yeah. And it's got a lot of... Uh, well, it's kind the of, supernatural one. It's the supernatural one, surely, but it also has some of the quirkier um, graphics, I guess I would call them. Yeah. Special effects. Special effects. effects. <laughs> right. I think it's all made better later when um he talks about being fucked by an oven full of witches <laughs> an oven of witches that really that one joke is enough for me to pay off yeah uh, 45 minutes of uh, something that's clearly not the best of the four well i don't know i definitely think that one of the things that i really like about this being the first one is that when the older bellhop right in the intro of the movie the last warning he gives him is to keep his dick in his pants. <laughs> and the first thing he does is get a blowjob. Great way to start your night. I would recommend that to everyone. Then we move right into the wrong man, which is completely different. Yeah. This uh, solidifies the fact we are doing four entirely separate stories. That's why, I mean, I guess it's darker. It's more psychotic. Sure. It feels more kind of threatening or violent. It's not as easygoing. It's not as, uh, you know... Tim Roth isn't going to have any fun in this. He's yeah. going, his life is going to be threatened. Yeah. Well, the whole thing kind of revolves around, and we get it. The, the one thing that I love about this film is that they do tie all the rooms together. Sure. He gets the phone call. He says, there's no needles here, kid. There's just a big fucking gun. Sure. Sure. That line kind of encapsulates the entire scene, the room 404, right? Yeah, right, right. And that and Lawrence Bender puking onto Ted's face. Is that Lawrence Bender that pukes? Oh, that's great. Lawrence Bender, the uh, infamous Tarantino producer. The infamous long-haired yuppie scum. Yeah, there's weird timing to that. Because when we get to the next room, I'm not sure there's actually enough time for him to uh, run downstairs and then also have this other event. <laughs> you know what I mean? It seems like there's a strange timing thing going on. Also, you're calling, you're calling into question the validity of Ted's travel time? That doesn't bother me as much. Which, what drives me nuts is 409 or 404. Yeah. Does the movie even know which room <laughs> they're talking about? I feel like, I feel like the door says 404. It yeah. could say 409, a four looks like a nine, whatever, that's fine. But then the guy is going to 404, they call 409. I'm incredibly confused by which room this is. I suppose that's the point. Yeah, they need ice. That party looks like a terrible place to be. When we get to the last room, we'll talk about good party versus shitty party. Versus and, uh, swell party. Yeah, this... <laughs> I guess what I mean is swell party versus cleaning up after fucking teenagers. Yeah, that sounds about right. The second room has a lot of the uh, interesting camera work, kind of the beginning of where stuff gets a little showy, uh, particularly that shot from behind the bathroom sink, the medic- yeah, medicine. Yeah, uh, I really, that, that one, that's a shot that I always forget is in the film Yeah, until I watch it. And every time I marvel at yeah, the ingenuity never, of that scene. You've watched these bathroom scenes over and over. Yeah. People reach into medicine cabinets all the time. We've talked about that being a horror cliche where the you know, the mirror comes Revenge back of the Titanic. There's something in the mirror. Perhaps Michael Myers, perhaps the Titanic. More stuff where no one knows what you're talking about. Well, they will. Oh, when I get a producer on my side. Your Titanic movie is never going to come out. It's going and to come out. That scene would never work. Anyways, it's never done from the other side from behind the cabinet it's just such a good idea to put a camera there it's a it's just a really interesting kind of twist on a scene that would be normally boring and we've watched it a million times but you also get the in between kind of inside outside wall shot Mm -hmm. as well as the camera pull away super uh far out tim ross character is here right with the with the that's a very tarantino-esque right arrow pointing at the the guy they, they did it uh, in Inglorious Bastards where they're pointing out the Nazis in yeah, the theater. Right. The thing that makes this for me, though, is the performances, especially um, Angela. Uh, Jennifer Beals, right? Yeah. Also from Lie to Me, if we're going to tag that already. Yeah, you know, she's just fucking great in here. Her reactions 
tell the whole story. That's mm-hmm. how you really get a feel of what the fuck is going on. Yeah. The fact that she seems, I, she doesn't seem threatened. She seems annoyed. Yeah. But not just annoyed like he does things like this all the time. More annoyed like not this again. Right. Kind of rolls her. You can tell she's been through this. It exact seems fucking like scenario. it seems like she's bored with the kink. Right. At yeah. this point, it's not that it's she's boring her. Yes. She's just over the kink. And by the time she's listing synonyms for cock, I mean that's where you end this story. Yeah. That is the the ultimate part of her performance. Uh, the thing that you will remember probably the most from this room, and uh, just where where you want to move to the next room which is the misbehaviors. So now we see a, a director we're talking Mr. Robert Rodriguez. Senor, right? please. But I don't even want to start talking about Rodriguez. I want to talk about Antonio fucking Banderas. Antonio Banderas is perfect. Oh in this. my god. Is perfect. He's sporting an almost John Waters type mustache. Yes, it is a John Waters mustache. And he's playing, I mean, as much as we talked about in Desperado and in the Mexico movies, you know, in in Desperado and in Once Upon a Time in Mexico. He has, uh, there's this, uh, this idea in the beginning of those movies of the legend, mm-hmm. you know, the kind of legend he is. Sure. And this is an even more stylized version of the man that would play that legend. Sure. Antonio Banderas, super Mexican gangster ultra star. Yeah. Is, uh, is what his character is in, in the misbehavior. Yeah. I mean, he's really, you're right. He's playing a stylized version of Antonio Banderas. <laughs> he's playing yeah. a stylized version of this important what people's fantasy of who antonio banderas exactly when the guy he's playing the man behind the nasen xb at this point the nasen xb (laughs) wow wonder if that one's getting tagged especially when you start to get to uh you know the don't misbehave kind of fucking boss shot yeah that, well, also uh, the the fucking when he's combing the kid's yeah, hair, right, 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 just everything. It looking up from the brow. I mean, the don't misbehave shot in particular, where it kind of zooms in on his face. Mm-hmm. It's uh, something we've never talked about with Rodriguez. We'll get to it. It's the kind of cover of From Dust Till Dawn as yeah. well. But that sort of diagonal headshot, semi under the brow, uh, just the composition of. The frame, but also the sort of zoom into it or or how you get to that place. Mm -hmm. It's just Rodriguez's amazing way that we discussed a little bit on Sin City of making everybody look uh, fucking spectacular, making them look huge and larger than life and like they dominate everything. They just look like complete badasses. It's weird to think about where this fits into Rodriguez's other stuff. This is still back in the uh, the days of film. Um, this mm-hmm. is before he's doing everything digitally. But it seems, and maybe it's part of it's because it has the kids in it. It seems like some kind of mixture of Spy Kids and Sin City, like a grungier version of both of those things. Yeah, I mean it. It kind, yeah, I think that's a perfect. You way have a, a to kids' adventure, right? So there's sure. the, the misadventures, the misbehaving. I don't know if I would call it a kids' adventure. I think it's an adults' well, adventure that I mean, children yeah. are having. Yeah, it's dirty. It's a dirty adventure kids should not be having filmed like it's shorts. Sure. I mean, the yeah, exactly. The entirety of the scene capitulates on this wonderful thing where the father comes home, mm-hmm. opens the door, and the camera does what his eyes do. And it sees all these terrible things that are... Right. He sees right. a photo of the worst moment in the room. Yeah, so you're talking about right after the the scene where Ted the Bellhop is running and inserts the key. We have that shot. Um, you're talking about Antonio Banderas busts open the door. Sure. And all of the things that the movie's kind of been setting up, that, yeah. uh, that this room's been setting up, are all happening at once. Yeah. There's the hooker in the mattress, the wine bottle, the needle in his leg, bullseye on everything's the wall. Everything's on fire. Selma Hayek dancing Stripping naked on the, on the TV. Everything's on fire. Kids just... Doing smoking, <laughs> yeah, right. Smoking, I mean, drinking. It's just, it's wonderful. It really, it's the stripper on the TV. That's something that Rodriguez shot particularly for this room. But I don't know if you caught this. They're watching his short um, bedhead, bedhead, yeah, yeah, in the background yeah. and in some of the other frames. Having those children smoking and drinking throughout the, you know, throughout the entire thing, finding that dirty needle, and then I, I don't know if this is just uh, hypochondria kicking in here. But I just don't want anyone to touch the needle. I don't. Yeah. I certainly don't want it to go into someone's fucking kneecap. Right. That's well, the last yeah. thing I want. 
then there's the dead prostitute and I hear them hear them saying, you know, she smells like shit and uh, swear to fucking God. And then how he smacks the kid. Yeah. How he smacks the kid twice and it makes this sound like like a fucking Rocky KO punch out. Yep. It's beautiful and it's dirty. And I'm amazed, you know, we talked a lot about Antonio Banderas, given that he's only in the beginning and end. Yeah. But just the impression that he makes. He's the star. Well, yeah. I mean, every time he's in a scene, we've, we've covered the hair combing scene, right? Uh, there's, of course, the great scene where he's paying out um, Ted. Right. And they kind of have that discrepancy just, over how much they're supposed to be paid. If you could seriously just tell me, I mean, that should be the trailer is simply we're going to watch Antonio Banderas in his most badass role debates somebody who is giving the performance of a right. silent bellhop. <laughs> I mean, that's stuff you pay to see, right? Yep. Or I think about that shot, too, where he's in the elevator and he has his wife held back. Yeah. And he fucking punches that, you know, kicks yep. out that elevator and button. Slicks his hair back. Right. Oh, so badass. The door is closing him. It's really perfect. It's everything yeah. I love about the way Rodriguez shoots. Yeah, but if you want to talk about something that you would pay to see, I'm going to paint a picture for you, Mr. Eric Ingram. Oh, geez. I think I know where this is going. You and I are super drunk. I have a very, very nice, in, in my case, it's a 1971 white Dodge Challenger. Sure. You want this car. I want to see you cut your pinky off. And all we need is a sandwich, a ball of twine, a cutting board, a hatchet sharp as the devil himself, a lighter, and what is it? Isn't there three nails? We also need Bruce Willis with hair. We need that's, Bruce Willis with hair. That's going to be important. We need the too. bartender from Pulp Fiction. And hell, let's get mm. uh, Jennifer Beals back up in here because sure. she's probably the hottest person in the movie. Meet her by the pool. That's fine. Before we even get to this, we have uh, Ted ready to walk out. Sure. Fucking problems, plural. I love that line. Problems, plural. And then we get up to the room and we have this um, scenario play out. Sure. Well, we have a long scene. One shot play out from when the door opens to right after Bruce Willis gets really pissed off. It's a, it's even a little bit after that. Yeah. Yeah. It's all this kind of point of view take. And it's you could count the number of uh, of shots in this entire room on one hand. Yeah. I mean, the, all of the shots are pretty long. None longer than that opening one, especially given that it has to ride on a performance by Quentin Tarantino. This I, honestly, I know we give Quentin Tarantino a super hard time because he's oh, not that good it. of an actor. But I think that if ever there were a testament to his ability to at least be a passable actor, today's double feature knocks it out of the park. Oh, you mean where he's playing a quirky director? Yeah, we also see him in the next film, where he has to play the very difficult part of sucking tequila off a foot. I feel like our scenario would be different because we don't drink be. our own cars. I can't honestly come up with a way that it would work out for us. So this is based off, uh, you know, he said, what does he say? The man from Tennessee or the, something? The man from Tallahassee. Tallahassee. Based off the man from the South, from the Alfred Hitchcock's pre, uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents stuff. And I think we straightened that out once previously on the show for whatever fucking reason. But the anticipation of what they're going to do here is really amazing. They tease this so well. The entire room really rides sure. on it, um, especially with the weird items. Um, the iconography there, but talking about that kind of lead up, it's exactly what made the old Alfred Hitchcock and Twilight Zone and Night Spring stuff all really memorable. Mm -hmm. You take a high concept premise, you cannot forget. These guys are making a deal. There is a wager on the line here. And you build up this wager. You build up what's going to be a single second. You have uh, our lead not even buying the premise. Right. So he has to be talked into it if the audience isn't already. Tarantino's character points out his going around the world method right. of storytelling. And ultimately, it comes down to one second. Lighter doesn't flick. Chop off the finger. Walk out of the room. It's so good. It I love that. Not I love be more that. well done. Yeah. At that point, if the lighter gets lit at all. It changes the way the scene plays out because if the lighter gets lit at all, then immediately there's this anticipation. Oh my God, there's a chance. They go for a joke instead, yeah. which is probably a way better choice here. Yeah. It's just, it's fucking fantastic. Ted grabs the money, does his silent Jerry Lewis walk out, <laughs> right, right. steps into the elevator, doors close. I believe that's when credits roll. I believe that's when Kane Hodder appears. 
Well, who? What does Kane Hodder do in this movie? By the way, I don't know. I, he no, he's a stunt player. Yeah, I think is what he's credited yeah, as. Yeah, but I don't know. I can't imagine where any what stunts, stunts he would. I don't see any physical body that looks like. Maybe Kane he's Hodder. dangling out of the window. Bizarre, but the credits playing over another long take. Obviously, one that people aren't going to pay as much attention to, but still something that's pretty awesome. Okay, so if that weren't enough, Rodriguez and Tarantino, we've Never got this enough. other film Never. called From Dust Till Dawn, which is directed by Rodriguez, written by Tarantino, also starring Tarantino, but honestly, the real star of this film... You're going to say Robert Kurtzman, right? Is Robert Kurtzman. No, the real star of this film to me is George Clooney. Wow, that's strange given that he's also the most obvious star. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have anticipated that. He I, really, I think this is the best George Clooney role Wow. In his career. That's what we, you know, we did good night and good luck on the show. We did. I mean, you're aware of that. I think he's amazing in that. I really like George Clooney as an actor, but nothing, nothing will ever top in either George Clooney's acting career or Quentin Tarantino's writing career. The line, they were not psychos. They were vampires. Psychos do not explode when sunlight hits them. I don't care how crazy they are. You know, we did Confessions of a Dangerous Mind on the show. Sorry, I'm still stuck back at... Well, You're right, it's an incredible line. All the dialogue in here is yeah. very uh, very Tarantino. It's, you know, the uh, plant yourself, plants don't talk. Ramblers, let's get rambling. What's in Mexico? Mexicans? I mean, we could do this <laughs> probably all day. My favorite is, uh, you won't be Jacob anymore. You'll be a lapdog for Satan. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to give Robert Kurtzman his brief moment in the spotlight. Please he, do. He's credited as coming up with the story. Robert Kurtzman was the director of Wishmaster. Oh. Who we, uh, we also talked about, I think he was a, a big special effects guy uh -huh. for a long time, if, uh, if I remember what we covered on the Wishmaster show. Sure. You'll have to forgive me, I block most of the Wishmaster episode <laughs> out of my mind. Remember that brief period where we thought, hey, we have to do Kill Up Loses with four movies, and then yeah. we never really did that again? Yep. Sort of. Yeah. But this is a movie that I am aware of enough that it was not our first hard-hitting Tarantino Rodriguez episode. Sure. Or our second. Right. Or really even our eighth. I think we've covered pretty much everything. We've got Spy Kids and Kill Bill. We, uh, we've covered most of what these guys have done. And we that even, one with the car. We even covered Four Rooms first. But this is a movie that I think most people watched, and maybe they weren't ready for vampires. Yeah. But they watched the first part, distinctly different from the second it part. It really is, yeah. And that's a totally fine thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing to do. However, when we get to these, uh, these levels of camp halfway through that are kind of akin to something like the faculty did yeah. throughout the entire movie, I think there's something uh, to be learned from comparing something like the, the faculty to yeah. uh, From Dust Till Dawn. Their premises are certainly different. They're setups. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily their premises, but the way that... I think it's just the mood and the... Yes. The, the way the monster the element unravels. You yeah. know what I mean? That's something you expect from the beginning in a movie like The Faculty. Sure. That's not something everybody signed up for in From Dust Till Dawn. Well, here's what I love about that, okay? We've covered vampire movies plenty on this show, so we don't need to talk about how this is a vampire movie. By plenty, we mean two. Right. Other than the fact that they point out that these are vampires based on their knowledge of vampire movies. Sure. Which I fucking love. Yeah. But what I think that this movie does wonderfully that all other vampire movies fail to do is walk not only the group of people, but the audience into an uh-oh vampire situation. Sure. Because that's more how it would go. Yeah. You would never know going in that you were about to be in a vampire situation. It, you would walk into a dingy Aztec bar. Danny Trejo would be your bartender. Tom Savini would have a revolver penis. And Fred Williamson would have Vietnam flashbacks. Right. Chingon would be playing some tunes, <laughs> sure. and then suddenly they're playing body parts, and Selma Hayek is honestly still kind of hot, but definitely from like a 10 Need, to like a 9.5. Right. And by Chingon, you mean that guy from the bar scene in Desperado that Quentin Tarantino pisses all over? Same thing. Yeah, so it's certainly not bad. Just most people aren't ready for it. Right. I mean, I think that's something you could almost factually prove. You watch the movie... The second half hits you like a fucking sock of quarters. Sure. And then you watch it again and you think, oh yeah, Selma Hayek's stripping. This is about when the insanity yeah. starts. 
it still fucking beams you in the face. Yeah. Well, and one thing you... You're ready for it, though. Well, yeah, but the thing is, is you watch the first half of the film knowing the second half is vampires, thinking, okay, there's clues. I'm going to pick up on right. the vampires. There aren't any. No, The not only a clue. clue that you get, the only tease you get to the second half of the movie is Cheech Marin. That's not a that's not a tease at all. No, but it's the only thing that you kind of realize, oh my god, we saw him already. That's the only thing that doesn't separate these as two distinctly different films that have the same characters in them. Also, if you can find pussy for less than a penny, fuck it. Cheech is not only the border op and the pussy lover, but the guy at the end. Yeah. He has a triple role in, in He's this He's the film. one they're waiting for. So I think we've probably gotten to the, the bottom of what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. That's the movie's brilliance. I love it. You have no idea there's vampires. You can't get a movie where a surprise there's vampires when you open the movie in a shot of the you know teenager's room with a vampire poster on right. the wall. Nod, wink, you know what's coming later, but we're going to get to that. Let's learn how the characters aren't going to expect. I mean, you're right. It's walking the audience through that journey. Yeah. Where the journey is, we had something else important going on. Oh, crap. Now it's vampires. And that kind of takes precedent over everything else. Yeah. So from from that, we go to all we're going to do is wait until morning to how do we make a steak jackhammer? Right. And kill a bunch of vampires. Yeah, it's it. certainly not a serious look at this. No, not at all. It's not seriously how would people behave in this situation or how would it... T- they still... There's vampires and they go, well, crap, now there's vampires. I yep. guess we're going to deal with that. Uh, does anybody it's, know anything about vampires? Isn't right. there something with silver? No, that's werewolves, stupid. What does it even matter? We don't have any silver. <laughs> so there's a lot of references to other Tarantino and Rodriguez stuff in here. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, most people catch some of them, if not all of them. But, uh, you know, there's the sheriff, first of all, yep. right? So who's in Planet Terror and who's in... Death Proof. In Death Proof as well, in Kill Bill. And there's the Desperado hand shot, you know. Uh, there's the Kahuna Burger, the the guy that's taking them to El Rey, who ends up being a character name. I think a lot of these are... Some of them, like Kahuna Burger, are clearly references. Sure. A lot of them are just things. I think the Tarantino ones are references, and yeah. the Rodriguez ones are just Universes. staples. It's his universe. They're, they're thing. Well, El Rey specifically. I mean, Rodriguez has talked a lot about how he hates naming characters. He just he's not very good at it. Uh-huh. And so we have El Rey here. We have, I think by the time he did Planet Terror, I don't think he even remembered that he put El Rey in another movie. Yeah. I think it's those kind of references. His cinematography and uh, all of the camera operation, the steady cam stuff that he's doing. It's just as awesome here as I was talking about in those few scenes of Four, Four Rooms. rooms. Yeah. Uh, Seth, uh, George Clooney's character, has the same diagonal composition close-up stare. Yeah. Uh, you, if be cool. Right. If that's not fucking boss enough, they come out of that little, uh, whatever the Texas equivalent of 7-Eleven is, uh-huh. in the beginning of the movie, with that series of explosions as they yeah. were, once again, very Desperado. Very the uh, A lot of the covers of Desperado feature that shot of mm-hmm. Antonio Banderas and Selma Hayek walking away from the explosion. Like, no big deal. And they're carrying on a Quentin Tarantino conversation yeah. as they walk away from the Robert Rodriguez explosions. They don't even notice. In yeah, the that's one of the best marriages of the two right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the entire movie. You know, that whole shootout felt very desperado bar scene. You also have in, in kind of mixing it up a little bit, the trunk shot taking the woman out of the hotel, mm-hmm. which we talked about as being a Tarantino thing that Robert Rodriguez is directing. In right. Here. You know, and they bring her into the Texas hotel room. That all feels very Devil's Rejects to me. Yeah, it does. Or maybe that one scene in Joyride. You know, just the the weird, dirty, bad things are going to happen here, hotel rooms. But what separates this, aside from some of the old school film sort of look of it, from the other Rodriguez stuff, is I think the editing's a lot more experimental. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more kind of... I mean, it's the sort of things he refined when he did Planet Terror. Yeah. You know, you have those slight pan and zoom sort of movements... Or uh, where the camera is moving a little bit, but you have a zoom as well. Almost the same thing when you use it and it's extreme that creates a vertigo shot. Just kind of the odd camera movement that you notice in other Rodriguez stuff, specifically in Planet Terror. But as far as the editing goes, you know, there's those flashes during the scene where um, Seth comes back and sees uh, what Richie's done to the girl. Yeah. And he's just staring into the room and there's, you know, one frame uh, inserts. There's a little bit of that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. in that opening bar scene, too. It just feels like they know, much like when they did Grindhouse, that this is not one of their epic works. This is one of their midnight movie works, and the people who see that 
are going to be okay with this editing. They're going to appreciate these different tactics yep. that they're using. This doesn't have to be, will people be able to swallow this in Pulp Fiction? When I think about the trunk shot, I also think about when they're all standing in the bathroom. Definitely not a Rodriguez staple, but it's one of those odd, where do you put the camera? Sure. You know, how does this scene uh, uh, look? It's, it's an unusual scene that you don't find in a lot of other movies. All three of these characters are sandwiched in this tiny bathroom. Right. Realistically, there's only one place you can put the camera there looking at the three characters. Yeah. You can't go back and forth between the... Di- I suppose you could do other things. Yeah. I'm not trying sure. to say there's no... You could have a bunch of close-ups. You could make it feel claustrophobic. But instead, that entire scene plays out from one perspective. All three of the characters talk to each other. And then Seth punches out Richie at yep. the end, which is the best fucking part. And Danny Trejo's in it, too. There. There's some more Rodriguez stuff. Let's talk about Quentin Tarantino, though. Yeah. He's acting. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino's acting. Quentin Aww. Tarantino's offering that if the offer still stands, he would totally eat out Juliette Lewis's pussy. Adorable. If she still wanted him to. But that's before he has to put his retainer in. So creepy. <laughs> There's also this this moment in the film, and you mentioned it, where you said, Selma Hayek's dancing, this is about where things get weird. Sure. I fucking love that you get so fucking turned on. Not you personally, you universally. As an audience. I do. Get so turned on watching Selma Hayek dance. And right about the time where you're just ready to just apologize to everybody in the room and whip it out. Or put your hand inside your vagina if you're a female. Thank you. I appreciate that. She turns into this creepy snake thing. (laughs) Sure. And (laughs) that's the moment where you realize that nothing that you had expected is going to play out the way you expected. Right. The movie knows what it's doing. Of course it delivers it at this moment. That's how it backhands you across the Exactly. And then you get Tarantino's forehead tripling as yeah. a vampire. Right. One of the uh, one of the better makeup jobs. The Tom Savini makeup job is yeah. great. Um, Fred Williamson just looks fucking terrifying. Yeah. I don't think we've covered Fred Williamson on the show. We talked about him a little bit in Shaft. Yeah. But there's uh we need to actually do a Fred one Williamson of his movies. film. I, I actually, I, I want to do, I think I want to do Boss Nigger on the, sure. on the show. He did Black Caesar too, didn't he? He did Black Caesar. Black I haven't Caesar's, seen either of those. It's not, Boss Nigger is this really kind of cool Western black exploitation, Sure, sure. Which is why I kind of want to cover it. I'm into it. But Fred Williamson is an old black exploitation actor. We he basically him. plays himself here. He does. You know, he, you get no introduction to this. Yep. I fucking love this. They go into the bar and Fred Williamson just happens to be there. Sure. And I know who Fred Williamson is having not seen any of his movies. Yeah. Don't See, know why. He's that's holding the, the cigar. Thing. Seems totally fine. Is Fred Williamson in this film is really great because unlike Tom Savini, who looks like he's supposed to be there. Sure. You see Fred Williamson, and if you've never seen him before in your life, never heard of him, you go, this is a cameo. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. They don't introduce him. He doesn't say anything about himself. They don't have, you know, in The Expendables, they did a lot of that, where yeah. they had these action stars who all kind of gave, here's a one-liner about who I am sure. and my backstory. Fred Williamson just walks in there and doesn't fucking care. He's yep. just Fred Williamson, and we the movie treats the audience as if they've known who he is the entire yep. time. Tom Savini, we always talk about being, hey, it's Tom Savini. Hey, it's Tom Savini. I don't know if we've ever really explained who Tom Savini is. Sex Machine. Okay, yeah, but not just in the film. Oh, you mean Tom Savini? Tom Savini is... Don't say Planet Terror and Machete. I I won't. Other ones. Other ones. Tom Savini is this horror guy. Mm. And most, most notably, makeup. Yes. He does monster makeup. He does violent makeup. He He is one of the few men that transcended many slasher genres sure he did the prowler he also did a few of the friday the 13th absolutely yeah he Three or uh, four of them he did the original dawn of the dead yeah um and then he i believe he doesn't he cameo in the remake the yeah he's Snyder in remake? the remake he did night of the living dead yeah too. he did uh not night of the living dead too but anyways uh texas chainsaw massacre as yeah. well um maniac I mean, he was in Maximum Overdrive, too. I remember him having some weird part in that. I don't remember uh, a lot of Maximum Overdrive. I remember Green Goblin truck. The thing mounted on the front of that truck kind of looks like the makeup effects in From Dust Till Dawn. Very, very similar. So he's one of these names as you watch more and more of these horror movies. One of the 
the unsung heroes that's not actually unsung people right. pull him out for cameos and acting and sure. do makeup effects all the time he had a cameo in the simpsons i mean that is the kind <laughs> right. of unsung sure unknown guy that he is one of the things i really love about tom savini and i think it's it's better that we just keep covering him in little chunks is that he's still doing makeup and effects today yeah that's still this wasn't oh hey i did the romero sure. stuff a long time ago sure. and now i'm it's kind of a you know kane hutter does a lot of that too where he's well known as being jason and sometimes he's featured in things like hatchet but of course still does stunt work yeah and so Savini's got a big enough name that he can act sure. now, but he also, he also still teaches. does makeup. Interesting. You know what? I think I knew that. Actually. A friend of mine actually had, yeah, took his class in this. Pennsylvania. So this really is his passion. It's not something he used to be into, and now he's spending all this time, you know, as an as a glamorous We're actor milking it. Yeah, he doesn't milk it like other people do. Yeah. So we covered Savini. We covered Williamson. We covered uh, George Clooney and Quentin Tarantino. I mean, Quentin Tarantino is just so, I mean, he's dweebish. He's, uh, it's amazing to think here is Quentin Tarantino in a leading role alongside George mm-hmm. Clooney. Where he's not a badass. I don't know that we can really cover this ever enough. How strange a moment this is. It's one of those moments that makes Robert Rodriguez an incredible friend. Yeah. He puts Quentin Tarantino in his movie in a period where Quentin Tarantino is trying to do a lot of acting and most of it's in Robert Rodriguez movies. He gives him this creepy role that he's good at. Although, I mean, Tarantino, you know, wrote the the screenplay. Sure. So part of this hint, all of the stuff with feet all throughout the film are Quentin Tarantino's doing. But how great is it that your buddy goes, hey, I know you're trying to act. How about I star you in this movie? You'll be on the cover with George fucking Clooney. And uh, I know you wanted to, you know, drink tequila off some woman's foot. How about we make it a half naked Selma Hayek? Yeah. You know, honestly, I'm not necessarily a foot guy, but I would drink tequila off Selma Hayek's foot. I've never had a drop of alcohol in my life. Oh, I love it. So I think all that camp really speaks for itself. Yeah, for sure. Especially after pointing out what the movie's doing and setting Mm -hmm. that up. It goes from zero to 100 in about five seconds, which is also commendable. Yeah, Just for how amazing that transition happens and how committed the movie is to just that's how it's going to be now. Totally fine. And once you kill that room of vampires, you kind of defeat the camp a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's not it, the whole time your jaw is on the floor. What the fuck are they doing in this movie? How, where did all these vampires come? I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what I'm watching. What is going on? They kill the room of vampires and suddenly it's kind of acceptable. It's yeah. almost like Tim Roth's performance in the previous movie. Yes. In the beginning, you're just thinking, what the fuck is he doing with his hands? What's going on? You get to the third room and you're just, well, that's how, that's who this guy is. Yep, that's Ted. The bellhop just behaves that way and that's fine. That's Theo the Thumper. By the time we kill the first room of vampires, we just have vampires, whatever. Let's just go with it. Not psychos. Not psychos, just vampires. I feel like uh, we get criticized all the time for our so-called hatred of supernatural movies Uh by people I'm sure have only listened to one or two episodes of the show. Clearly, we've covered. We don't cover any movies we don't want to talk about, except during Killapalooza. And we often cover movies like constantine or what dreams may come is maybe a bad example for what i just said but movies that have supernatural elements and we can treat them like what they are i think that's best surmised by you know what they're talking about the great line that seth delivers when he says i don't want to hear about how you know you don't believe in vampires i don't believe in vampires what I do believe in is, you know, what's right in front of my eyes. We can all agree at this point that what we have here is vampire. I think we're all in agreement yep. with that. And then he, he talks about, okay, mm. what do we know about yeah. vampires? Yeah, it's perfect. It's beautifully stated. It's the uh, the official on the record for, uh, for this show's feelings. Agreed. One of the weirder things about this movie, though, and part of it's probably the set. Mm-hmm. You know, when we talk about uh, the makeup uh, and the second half perhaps being more jarring than the first half, I think most of that is owed to the fact that this is the most overlit bar in all of fucking Mexico. (laughs) It is so bright in there. There is uh, not a shadow in the entire goddamn place. This is obviously a set they built, but the lighting is really why you, you know, why you notice that. So maybe that's one of the reasons being so brightly lit that it feels, you know, the movie's treating vulgarity, nudity, sin, like it's uh, normal and fun and safe. In Mexico, this is just how they do it. Yeah. Not a big deal. And it, it's just strange to me how normal that bar scene is. 
maybe it's just the the spy kids elements of it yeah you know the the fact that we've already been talking about that with four rooms and now i'm watching from dust till dawn i'm still thinking about fucking shark boy and lava girl and as i'm watching from dust till dawn something about it seems even more perverse it seems like the titty bar at disneyland you know what i mean it's just you know they say something it's and i just go can they do this can they show a nipple in this movie wow this is but i mean come on look at the this is the ninth movie in a row this year that's shown nipples. I yeah. mean, it's not, we've never made a big deal of it before, kind of. We've never gone, wow, that should be off the table. But as I'm watching from dusk till dawn, I strangely think, how did they get away with this? Isn't yeah. this, I, I think in my head, how did they do this in a children's film? Yeah. I don't yeah. know why I'm thinking You basically, that. you're saying to yourself, take the titties off the table. Never in my life would I say that. I'm saying, why aren't other children's films getting away with putting titties in their, their movies? Well put. If we had a broadcasting license, it would have been taken away years ago. Yeah, definitely true. Next up on Double Feature, we have some more excellent, excellent stuff. Yeah, we do. In the meantime, you can go to our websites. Yeah. You can uh, check out DoubleFeatureShow.com. You can see all the other Tarantino and Rodriguez stuff in there. Yep. You can see our Tarantino and Rodriguez director pages. Ooh, exciting. With pictures, believe it or not. Of Tarantino and Rodriguez. Are there feet? There aren't enough okay, feet. Okay, are there on feet the or cowboy hats in the pictures? There's a cowboy hat at the very least. Okay. I should just edit some feet into Tarantino's pictures. It should be, you know, the, the cover of Polyester where it has yeah. the smell of vision bubble, the, the yeah. bright, shiny, as seen on TV, smell of vision <laughs> yeah. bubble. We should do that for Quentin Tarantino's picture with just some feet in so there. So it's now with foot fetish? Send your, don't send pictures of feet to double feature show at gmail.com. Uh, next time we're gonna do movies that don't have vampires we're gonna do the conversation and rear window in a kind of um what i guess hey we're spying on you yeah that's what we're gonna much. call it i don't want to use the v word i'm sure we're gonna use that plenty next week nausea i'm gonna say hey i'm I'm peeking at you from over here behind these blinds that's okay. what that's what the point's gonna be of uh the next show sounds great creepily peek at more fucking film excellent bye